given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. A man wants to find out about taking part in a dragon boat race. Listen to the conversation between the man and the woman and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions one to five. Scope Charity Office, how can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm ringing about the dragon boat race that you're asking people to take part in. Oh, yes. We still need a few more teams. Are you interested in joining the race? Yes. We want to enter a team, but we don't know anything about it. Could I ask you for some more information first? Of course. I don't even know when it's being held. <laughs> it's taking place on the 2nd of July. Is that a Saturday? No, it's a Sunday. It's a much more popping. Right. And where's it being held? At the Brighton Marina. Oh. Uh, I'm an overseas student. Could you spell that for me? Yes. It's uh, Brighton Marina. That's M-A-R-I-N-A. Do you know where it is? I'm not sure. It's a couple of miles past the Palace Pier. Oh, yes. I know it. You take a right turning off the coast road, or you can cycle along the seafront. That's good. What time does the race start? Well, the first heats begin at 10am, but you need to register half an hour before that, at 9.30, and we really recommend that you aim to be there by 9. It's a good idea to arrange a meeting place for your team. Right. And the race is to help raise money for charity? It is. We're asking every pound by getting friends and or relatives to sponsor them. Every crew member will receive a free tournament t-shirt if your team manages to raise a thousand pounds or more. Oh, that's quite good. Also, we're holding a raffle. Every crew member who takes part in the race this season will be entered into a free prize draw. Oh, what's the prize? It's pretty good. It's a holiday in Hong Kong. Sounds great. The man asks for more information. Look at questions six to ten. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 6 to 10. Is there anything else you need to know? Uh, could you just tell me a little bit more about the teams? Well, you need to have a crew of 20 people for your dragon boat, and you then need to agree on who's going to be the team captain. That would probably be you. Fine. Um, I've got a group of 20 people who are interested. Uh, do all the team members have to be a certain age? Well, there's no age limit as such, but if you have a team member who's under 18, then they have to get their parents' permission to take part. Yes, that makes sense. It isn't dangerous, but we do have boats that turn over in the water, and for that reason, we need to insist that everyone wears a life, their life jacket from us when your team arrives. What do you advise people to wear? Well, most people wear a t-shirt, shorts and trainers. I certainly wouldn't recommend that you wear jeans or boots. In fact, it's a very good idea to bring some spare clothes. Okay. It can get quite cold and wet if the weather's bad. And there's quite a bit of hanging around, especially if you qualify for the semi-finals or the final. I see what you mean. Have you got a name for your team? Oh, not yet, no. Well, you need to decide on one and then put it on the entrance form, which I'll send you. Oh, okay. So, if you'd like to give me your address, I'll be happy to send details first time. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part 2. You will hear a talk by a wildlife specialist on a type of bird called a kiwi. First, look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Auckland Zoo on this sunny Sunday afternoon and to our special Kiwi fundraising event. My job is to tell you all about the amazing little Kiwi and your job, hopefully, is to dig deep in your pockets. <laughs> now, for the benefit of our overseas visitors here today, I should explain first of all that the Kiwi is the national bird of New Zealand and sometimes New Zealanders themselves are known as Kiwis. Now, while Kiwis in the wild are a rare sight, the Kiwi as a symbol is far more visible. Apart from being in toy stores and airport shops all over the world, you'll find them on... The Kiwi is the smallest member of the genus Apteryx, which also includes ostriches and emu. It gets its name from its shrill call, which sounds very much like this. Kiwi! Kiwi! Kiwis live in forests or swamps, and feed on insects, worms, snails, and berries. It's a nocturnal bird with limited sight, and therefore it has to rely on its very keen sense of smell to find food, and to sense danger. Its nostrils are actually right on the end of its long beak, which is one third of the body length. Now, here's an interesting fact. Although kiwis have wings, they serve little purpose, because the kiwi is a flightless bird. Since white settlement of the islands, Kiwi numbers have dropped from 70,000, and our national bird is rapidly becoming an endangered species. This is because they're being threatened by what we call introduced animals. Animals which were brought to New Zealand, such as cats and ferrets, which eat kiwi eggs and their chicks. Now look at questions 16 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. And so we have launched the Kiwi Recovery Program in an all-out effort to save our national bird from extinction. There are three stages to this program. Firstly, we have the scientific research stage. This involves research to find out more about what Kiwis need to survive in the wild. Then secondly, we have the action stage. This is where we go into the field and actually put our knowledge to work. We call this putting science into practice. And then we come to the third stage, the global education stage. By working with schools and groups like yourself, as well as through our award-winning Kiwi website, we'll hope light of the Kiwi. As part of the action stage, which I just mentioned, we've introduced Operation Nest Egg, and this is where your money will be going. It works like this. It's a three-stage process. First of all, we go out to the kiwi's natural habitat and we collect kiwi eggs. This is the tricky part, because it can be very difficult to find the eggs. Then, in safe surroundings, away from predators, the chicks are reared. Now, this can be done on predator-free islands or in captivity. They're reared until they're about nine months old, at which stage the chicks are returned to the wild. So far, it's proving successful. And since we started the program, some 34 chicks have been successfully raised this year, have increased from 5 to 85 percent. However, it's not time to celebrate kiwi survival just yet. About 95 percent of kiwi chicks still don't make it to six months of age without protection. Which is why Operation Nest Egg is so important. And we ask you to give generously today.
That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part three. You will hear two students, Sharon and Zhao Li, talking to their tutor about a presentation they gave the previous week. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. So, Sharon and Zhao Li, in your presentation last week, you were talking about the digital divide, the gap between those who can effectively use communication tools, such as the internet, and those who can't. And you compared the situation here in Northern Ireland with Southeast China. Right, so I asked you to do some self-evaluation, watching the video of your presentation and thinking about the three main criteria you're assessed by. Content, structure, and technique. What do you think was the strongest feature of the presentation when you watched it? Uh, Sharon? Well, I was surprised, actually, because I felt quite nervous. But when I watched the video, it didn't show as much as I expected. So which of the criteria would that come under? Uh, confidence? Mm, that's not actually one of the criteria as such. Jolie? Technique? It's body language and eye contact, isn't it? Well, I didn't think I looked all that confident. But I think that our technique was generally good like the way we designed and used the PowerPoint slides. Hmm. So, you both feel happiest about that side of the presentation? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, uh, now on the negative side, uh, what would you change if you could do it again? Well, at first, I thought that the introduction was going to be the problem, but actually, I think that was okay. We defined our terms, identified key issues. It was more towards the end. The conclusion wasn't too bad, but the problem was the questions. Hmm. We hadn't really expected there'd be any, so we hadn't thought about them that much. Uh -huh. Okay, uh... Anything else? Well, like Zhao Li says, I thought the conclusion was okay, but when I watched us on the video, I thought the section on solutions seemed rather weak. Hmm. Can you think why? Well, we explained what people are doing about the digital divide in China and Northern Ireland, but I suppose we didn't really evaluate any of the projects or ideas. It was just a list, and that was what people were asking us about at the end, mostly. You now have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. OK, now I also asked you to get some peer evaluation from the other students. Yes, uh, well, people said it was interesting, like the fact that in China the internet was used more for shopping than in Northern Ireland. They said sometimes it was a bit hard to understand because we were talking quite fast, but we didn't think so when we watched the video. No, it's a bit different though, because you know all this information already. Mm. If you're hearing it for the first time, you need more time to process it. That's why signposting the structure and organisation of the talk is important. That seemed OK. No one mentioned that as a problem. Some people said that we could have had more on the slides, like some of the other groups had nearly everything they said written up on the visuals as well. Hmm. But other people said the slides were good. They had just the key points. Yes. And most people said we had quite good eye contact and body language. They all pointed out we'd overrun. They all said we were five minutes over. But we timed it afterwards on the video, and it was only three minutes. We were a bit unsure about the background reading at first, but I think we did as much as we could in the time. Anyway, no one commented on that under content. But one thing that did come out was that they liked the fact we'd done research on both Northern Ireland and China. Most other people had just based their research on one country. We managed to get quite a lot of data from the internet, 
although we had to do our own analysis, and we did our own surveys as well in both countries. So the class gave us best feedback for content, but it was all okay. Right. Well, that's quite similar to the feedback I'm giving you. I was very impressed by the amount of work you'd done and by your research methodology. So, actually, I'm giving you full marks for content. Five. Oh. <laughs> The structure of the presentation was good, but not quite as good as the content. So, I gave that four, and the same for technique. So, well done. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> now, the next stage is to write up your report. So, just a few pointers for you here. First of all, in your presentation, I think your ending was rather abrupt. You suddenly just stopped talking. Yeah. It wasn't a big problem, but think about your closing sentences in your report. You want to uh, round it off well. Mm. One thing I forgot to mention earlier was that I felt a very strong point was that after you'd given your results, you explained their limitations. The fact that we didn't have a very reliable sample in terms of age in China. Yes, that section. So don't forget to include that. Mm. And you had some excellent charts and diagrams. But maybe you could flesh out the literature review a bit. Mm. I can give you some ideas for that later on if you want. OK, uh, is there anything else you want to ask? Um, no, no, thank you. Thanks. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a student giving a presentation about some ways of dealing with the problems of urbanization and city growth. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, Adam's just been talking about some of the problems that have resulted from the rapid growth of cities in the last hundred years. Things like housing, sanitation, crime and so on. For my presentation, I'd like to look at some examples of what cities are doing to try to solve some of these problems. As part of its Healthy City program, the World Health Organization, the WHO, has come up with a set of criteria for a healthy city. The WHO says that, amongst other things, a healthy city must provide a clean environment which is also safe. It mustn't be dirty or dangerous for its inhabitants. As well as that, the WHO says a healthy city has got to be able to satisfy its inhabitants' basic needs. That's all its inhabitants, not just the rich ones or the ones with jobs, everyone who lives there. A third thing, a third criterion, is that it's got to have health services which can be used by all the inhabitants and which they can access easily. The final point to do with local government. The WHO says this is something that the whole community should be involved in, not just a few powerful politicians or businessmen. So, healthy city is not just a matter of avoiding illness, that sort of healthiness. It's the way that the whole city works together for the benefit of its population. OK, so what I'd like to do now is to look at some projects in different cities around the world where cities have tried to meet these criteria, to make their cities healthy ones. Right, the first project I'm going to discuss took place in Sri Lanka, and this project was called the Community Contract System. Its aim was to improve the places where the poorest section of the population lived, the squatter settlements. Basically, the problem was lack of infrastructure, things like drains, paths, wells for water and so on. So, a programme was set in place to construct this infrastructure. But what was different about it was that the residents did this, the people who actually lived there, not people from outside. And this meant that not only did the people end up with improved housing and infrastructure, but also because they had contracts with the community, it improved their chances from an economic point of view. So that's the way the lives of people in one urban environment were improved. The next project I'd like to discuss took place in the capital city of Mali in West Africa. This project involved setting up a cooperative to try to solve the problems of sanitation in the old central quarters of the city. One of the main problems was a lack of a system for garbage collection, which meant that there were a lot of insects and this was causing disease. 
And again, it's interesting to look at who was involved in dealing with this problem. In this case, the cooperative involved students who had graduated from secondary school in getting a system going. As well as that, the cooperative set up a campaign to educate the public about the importance of good sanitation through showing films and setting up discussion groups among the local people, especially women and adolescents. And the outcome was an increased environmental awareness, which led to changes in household behaviour, as well as improved living conditions. OK, the third project was in Egypt, just outside the capital, Cairo, which is a city that's grown very rapidly in the last few decades. This project was based in a women's centre in a poor area called Makatan. The aim of the project was to support girls, young women from the area from poor families. So these were women who had no education. They'd never been to school, so they were totally illiterate, and they had no chance of getting jobs. At the women's centre, they were shown how to sew and how to weave, and once they'd learned these skills, they were given the equipment, a sewing machine or a loom, so that they could make things to sell and had a chance of earning their own living. And this project has meant that these young women have greater status in the community, but as well as that, they can enjoy a better quality of life. So I don't think the problem is that cities are bad. This world and its cities have the resources to provide for the population that lives there. What it takes is a stronger will and a better distribution of resources. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.